David Brooks is someone I've been looking forward to chatting with here. He's a, a cultural commentator. He's an opinion columnist at the New York Times. He's a commentator on PBS, NPR, at the News Hour on those. And you teach at Yale. And David, I have to confess that uh, I look to you often in your writing and your speaking and teaching, as I would think of it, as uh, being uh, someone I look to to help me think about things. And you, you, you give me a way of understanding things that are complex that uh, that uh, I, I appreciate and use a lot. And I, I've been, since reading your newest book, How to Know a Person, and I've I've really found it to be profound and important. And at uh, in our in our writings, uh, we have a, a newsletter that we put out every Sunday here at the Flowers Companies and at Worth, our, our magazine company. Uh, I write every week about uh, relationships. And uh, we've written a lot over the last few years about uh, about the loneliness epidemic, which you touch on in, in some real detail. And you talk about mega trends and uh, the way you summarize how the mega trend of class, how that's evolved over time and circling around community and education and how that helps separate us and, and drive this new class system. But then you talk about the other mega trend of social and emotional uh, uh, crisis that's going on. I wondered if you'd kick us off with something really depressing and tell us about <laughs> How you see that mega trend? What what's causing it? How is social media contributing to it? And you know what might the future hold for us now? Okay. Well, first, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. And I can tell by the way you said the word often that we probably came from the same part of the country. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I confess to being a New Yorker, but you escaped to Philadelphia. I escaped, but I was still formed there, and I still my emo emotional home is still New York City. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we'll start to the depressing stuff. Um, over the last 20 years, something something really troubling has happened uh, to American society and other societies around the world, which is a rise of mental health crisis, a 30% rise in suicide, much higher for teenagers. Uh, the number of people who say that no one knows them well is up to 54% now. Uh, the number of people who say they have no close friends has increased fourfold since 2000. The number of teenagers um, who say they are persistently hopeless and despondent is up to 45%. Uh, and so it's just statistic after statistic, and it all points to the same thing, which is a breakdown in our relationships. And so I've written a lot about community and relationships in the past, but I decided it's all too abstract, that building a relationship, building a community, and being helpful in response to this crisis involves a set of social skills. You, In order to build a friendship, build a marriage, build a community or build a company, you've got to be able to perform social skills. You've got to be a good conversationalist, good at listening, good at disagreeing. You've got to be good at offering somebody criticism in a caring way. Uh, you've got to be good at asking and offering forgiveness, sitting with someone who's depressed, hosting a dinner party or meetings so where everybody feels included. And these are skills just like, you know, learning carpentry or tennis is a skill. And so in the book, I just spent four years asking experts, tell me about these skills. How do you teach them? How do you do this stuff? And the book is meant to be a positive and very practical attempt to say, here's how you solve these skills, and this is how you'll build relationships and restore the connections that are so lacking in society. Well, it very much is a how-to book, David. It, 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 it's just terrific. And at the end of uh, the year, the beginning of the year, on a, following the calendar, uh, one of the things that I've been taking to uh, a, a fellow I befriended during COVID is a wonderful guy named Dr. George Everly. He uh, a psychologist. He, he's uh, on the faculty at uh, Johns Hopkins and at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was working with him on what should we talk to our community about in terms of being deliberate about investing your efforts and learning your skills, the skills that you teach about having more and better relationships. And in our conversations, he divided it into three categories. And so at the beginning of the year, we suggest not only should you make your resolutions about health and and uh, and uh, exercise and what you're going to eat and what you're going to read and what other skills you might invest in, but you should be deliberate and develop a relationship plan. And the three categories of people we work on with Dr. George is the first category, people you already have relationships with and you want to continue to invest in those. People who you've had relationships with, but maybe they've waned. 
and you don't have the frequency of contact and the relationship isn't where you'd like it to be or where it might have once been, how do you say, oh, of those six people in that category, these are four that I, I'd really like to invest in. And then the last category, who are two, three, four, five people you don't have a relationship with, but you would like to, and you'd like to invest in those. So it seems to me that, and we're building some tools uh, that will give away to our uh, customers, our community, that they can keep track of that. Nice thing about AI, and I'll ask you about AI and what impact do you think this all has on our ability to have and maintain relationships and develop new ones, is one of the good uh, aspects is that we can embed it in our tool, the idea of, I said, geez, I'd like to get to know David Brooks better. And we know that he's interested in uh, in history because he double majored at, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, new book out on history that's getting a lot of reviews. It might remind me that you said you wanted to develop a relationship with David. There's a book out that he might be interested in based on what we know about him and what we can learn about him. You might want to recommend it to him or send an article about it to him. So there seems to be some benefit there. But it mm. seems to me that your how-to book needs to start with the idea that someone has to want to invest in developing and maintaining and investing in relationships. Tell me how you think about why people may not want to and need to. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there there was one of the people I interviewed for the book is a guy named Nick Epley, and he's a social psychologist at University of Chicago, my alma mater. Uh, and he uh, he was commuting to work one day, and he's looking at the commuter train, and he because he's a psychologist, he knows the things that makes us happiest is connection and relationship. And then mm -hmm. he's looking at the, around the commuter train, and there's nobody talking to each other. They're just on their screens. And so he says, What's going on here? Why aren't people doing the thing that makes them happiest? And so he's a social psychologist. So he paid them for the next several months. He paid the commuters to talk to each other. And he said, talk to a stranger on the train. I'll give you 50 bucks. And they did it. And then he interviewed them afterwards. And they all reported, this has been one of the best rides I've had. It's a thousand times better than sitting there looking at TikTok or whatever I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so, and he, his conclusion is we underestimate how much fun it will be to talk to strangers we underestimate how uh, deep people want to go quickly. And we just, we're too shy to take the first step. We also don't think we know how to do it. We don't know what to say. We're afraid we'll invade somebody's privacy. Or we're too egotistical. We're just busy thinking about ourselves to care about other people. I often leave a party and think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. Uh, and there, I've concluded only about 40% of humanity are question askers. The rest are just, they're nice people. They're just not that curious about you. Uh, and so these are all the reasons we don't reach out. But I found, you know, since I've been working on this book, I'm now way more likely to talk to a stranger on, on a train or on a plane than I used to be. And the other thing, I'm way more likely to ask questions that are big questions. So in each, I'm, I found those three buckets very helpful. But within each of those buckets, how do you build the relationship that is your goal? And mm -hmm. so to me, the essence of that is conversation, being really good at conversation. Yes. And the quality of your conversation depends on the quality of your questions. So if we're just meeting somebody in that third category, somebody we're just going to know, I might say to them, like, where'd you grow up? And they start talking about their childhood. And suddenly when they're talking about their childhood, immediately you're getting to know them. And then as we begin to establish some rapport, I may ask a silly question, like, what's your favorite unimportant thing about you? And so, like, I asked this to about an academic guy, and he said, you know, I love reality trashy TV. And I got a little window into him, and, like, he said, well, what's yours? And I said, well, I actually like early Taylor Swift more than I like later Taylor Swift. And so he, a little window. And mm -hmm. then when you know somebody, you can ask big questions that pull them out of their, that are going to guarantee a memorable conversation. And there are things like, um, if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's this chapter about? Or how do your ancestors show up in your life? We're all affected by our ethnic heritages. So how are you affected by your ethnic heritage or the culture of your grandparents and ancestors? Or um, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Fear plays a role in our lives. And I had a friend who, um, he was being interviewed for a job. He turned around and he asked the interviewer, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And she started crying because she wouldn't be doing HR for that company. She's too afraid to quit. 
Uh, and so there are the, like some of the bigger questions I got from a guy named Peter Block who writes about community. Mm -hmm. And those are things like, um, what commitment have you made that you no longer believe in? Or uh, what gift do you currently hold in exile? Uh, and like, what talent do you have you're not using? And so if you ask those big questions, most of the time you're going to have a great conversation and you'll leave with that, that relationship very much enhanced. So much of what you say just rings so true, and it, but but you bring it to life with these great examples. Uh, we hosted a, an event here in town last night, and I wanted to, uh, advice I give to my kids. I have three grown kids, David, seven, more importantly, seven grandkids. And uh, I was a shy kid, and I'm still in recovery there, but doing a pretty good job. Uh, the, the One of the things we at this party last night, I sat down with our team. We were the host. And wound up, we had a couple hundred people there. And it was a really nice time. And I sat down with our team, uh, who were about eight of us, and reminded us all that we're all going to be hosts. And it's what I counsel my kids to do, too, to overcome their shyness. Because when you're at a party, or you're at an event, cocktail party, dinner party, if you think like a host, you're mm -hmm. not thinking about how you feel. You're right. thinking about it. You're busy trying to make sure everyone else has a good time. And, you, and you're trying to get everyone else to talk. And if they do, I found, even in a business meeting, if you're going to go around and ask people, what did you think of the meeting? What they thought of the meeting and how positive they think of it is directly proportionate to how much they spoke. Mm, yeah. Hmm. So what you say is to get pe to draw people out, it just, just rings so true. And you talk in the book about uh, being an illuminator. And I think that's you know, when you when you phrase it like that, it's our job as business people, as trying to be business leaders, business managers, is really a big part of our job is to be an illuminator, isn't it? Yeah. But before I get to that, let me I just found that very fascinating what you said about the meeting, because I read a study recently that how do you be persuasive? How do you persuade somebody? And it turns out the best way to be persuasive is to listen. <laughs> you mm. think it'd be a talk. But it's to listen and then tease out their point of view and then offer your other point of view. But it, listening is more powerful in persuading than talking. Mm -hmm. And the other thing a friend of mine says, in every conversation, you know, you're either talking or listening. When you're talking, you should behave as if you're a guest at a dinner party. I'm bringing a gift. And if you're listening, you should behave as if you're the host of the dinner party. I'm uh -huh. welcoming in you. And so even in the little volleys we have back and forth, we're switching roles, guest and host, guest and host. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to be the the distinction I draw in the book is between diminishers and illuminators. Yes. And so diminishers are people who are not curious about you. They don't ask you questions. They stereotype. They ignore, and they make you feel small and unseen. And illuminators are people who are curious about you. They understand your point of view. They get you, and they make you feel respected and lit up. And so there was a novelist um, uh, named Ian e. Foster who wrote like oh just over a century ago. And his biographer wrote of him that he he projected a kind of what the author called a, an inverse charisma. He listened to you with such intensity, you had to be your sharpest, most honest, and best self. That's just a great quality of listening. Another example of an illuminator is Jenny Jerome. And there's a story told about her, uh, which is that she later would become Winston Churchill's mom. But before, she was a young woman. Uh, and she was at a dinner table, and she seated, was seated next to, in Victorian England, um, William Gladstone, who was the prime minister. Mm. And she left that dinner thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. Then sometime later, she seated at another dinner party next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. Mm -hmm. And she leaves that dinner thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. So that's an illuminator. Somebody who <laughs> makes you feel like you're the cleverest person in this room. And the one a so, final story I'll tell, I got it from a guy named Rabbi Elliot Kukla, who I read about. Um, he had a congregant who had suffered a brain injury. And so sometimes he just, she just fell to the floor. And she, she would just fall. And she said, people rush to lift me up off the floor because they're so uncomfortable seeing an adult on the ground. And she says, but what I really need at that moment is for somebody to get down on the ground with me. And so an illuminator doesn't do what makes them most comfortable. Yes. They do what the other person needs. And so they get down on the ground with someone. And someone, sometimes metaphorically or physically, you just have to get down on the ground with someone. Mm. You, you wrote about uh, a fellow at Bell Labs. I think he's 
uh, Harry Nyquist? Yeah. So the story there is that some of the researchers at Bell Labs were so much, much more creative than the other researchers, more innovative. And the patent lawyers at Bell Labs trying to figure out why are these people so much more pr productive than the others? Yeah. And they checked out their IQ. They checked out their educational background. They couldn't figure it out. And they finally fi figured out that the people who are the most productive were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Nyquist would get inside their problems, would ask them about what, they, what are they doing at work. He would get into their thinking, and you, he would help them solve their problems. And so Harry Nyquist was another illuminator. Something else, just the way you phrase things, David, uh, you, when you wrote about and talk about uh, a situation where you were sitting, I think, in the your dining room table, uh, reading a book, and your wife went to the door, and the way you painted the picture, I'll ask you to tell the story, but it's all about the word behold. Yeah. Most of the book is about how much, how great it is to feel when somebody sees you, when they get you. And I've spent four years asking people, tell me about a time you felt seen and understood, and people with glowing eyes would tell me about episodes in their lives when somebody just got them. Uh, but it's also great to be the seer. And so a few years ago, I'm sitting at my dining room table reading a book, uh, and in our house, you can see the front door from the dining room. And my wife opens the door, and she's just standing there. Uh, and the summer sun is coming in behind her. Uh, and um, I, she doesn't even notice I'm there, because that's the kind of charisma I have. <laughs> uh, and, and her eyes are resting on an orchid that we keep on the table by the front door. And I have this sensation sweep across my mind, which is, I know her. I really know her. I know her through and through. And if you'd asked me what I, how I knew her at that moment or how I was looking at her, I wasn't inspecting her. I wasn't observing her. I wasn't scrutinizing her. I was just beholding her. And so I, it was like just a, a sense of I just such appreciation and, and love and just a sense of I'm so lucky to know this person. And I, I not only know their outdoor biographical, biographical facts, I know their whole flow of their being. Yeah, uh, I know the, her rise of moods and the symphony of how she is. And I told a few weeks after it happened, I told a, another couple who were older than me uh, about this story and how the only word in the English language was beholding. And they said to me, uh, yeah, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just mm -hmm. sometimes we just behold them. And it's it's a it's a great feeling. Having read that story and feeling the emotion of of that you paint. Uh, you caused last month in, in the McCann household a really interesting post-Thanksgiving dinner conversation because I found myself, uh, I have, we're lucky we have, uh, uh, we have seven grandchildren. The oldest is just turned 15. The youngest is two. And everyone had cleared from the table. Everyone was in the kitchen and cleaning up, and it was just me and the two-year-old in the dining room. Mm -hmm. And I found myself just looking at her. And I recalled you having written about that. And I yeah. said, and I, now I feel what you meant, David, by yeah. beholding. And so as I, my kids started to drift back into the dining room for dessert being brought to the table, I told the story about mm. you and about how you looked at your wife and how the word behold just seemed to capture how you were thinking and feeling. And we had the most wonderful conversation mm over dessert uh, at the Thanksgiving table as a result of me recounting uh, your story in the book there. And it just, it just captures it, makes you, makes you think differently. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful story. I'm, I'm so grateful to have been a small part of that story. I will say when I, uh, when I talk to my college students about um, somebody who really shaped them, 80% uh, of the time they, they write about a grandparent. Uh, it's not their parents or it's not some teacher. There's something about that grandparent-child relationships that is just so powerful. Which is my, why my wife and I are so intent on sticking around. <laughs> Good, yes. <laughs> Another incentive. Uh, a friend of uh, mine who you may know, is he's a great chef and restaurateur, Tom Caligio. He owns Kraft in New York City, Kraft Hospitality Group. And we had a chat on this program a couple of months ago, and he said the same thing, David, about... He was thinking about his the things he loves to do in life today. He loves to fish. Mm -hmm. He loves to garden, grow vegetables, and he loves to cook. 
And he said, those are the three things I did with my grandfather in Newark, New Jersey. Interesting. Yeah. And he said, I, my father was a wonderful man, but I didn't really do anything with him. Yeah. And he said, all the things I love today, I did with my grandfather. Yeah. My grandfather was sort of an immigrant kid from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And he, he gave me that sense that we're, we're trying to make it in this country. He gave it a sense of ambition, a sense of drive. And he was a very good writer. He was a, a lawyer, but he really wrote good briefs. And uh, one of his hobbies was to every couple of days submit a letter to the editor of the New York Times, which sometimes got in. So the day I was hired at the Times to be a columnist, he'd already died. But I, he would have been my first call to, to say that you wrote all those letters to the editor. Now I got to be a columnist at the New York Times. It would, it would have been a good, great conversation. I think he heard you. Yeah, I hope so. As a good writer, did that rub off on what your interests are? Yeah, I, th I think he did. He really... Well, he really valued writing, and yeah. he wrote these beautiful letters to me. And I remember it, when I was a went away at summer camp, he would write these long letters about his neighborhood, about his childhood, about giving advice. And those letters were very formative to me. Uh, the The impulse of being like the immigrant mentality was a part of it, but also was that emphasis on writing. So, of course, I wanted to become a writer. That grandparent relationship, when we're lucky enough to have them or to be in yeah. those relationships, uh, it, yeah. It, I think it pays to stop and think about, and that's what you did for us in your book, uh, 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 how to know a person. When you think about it in terms of the re the family relationships we have, you cause us to stop and be deliberate, not just find your way through life in an undeliberate way, but to be deliberate about where you spend your time, yeah. what's important to you, what what lessons do you want them to take from you, and if yeah. and if they, if like me with my grandfather or Tom Calicchio with his grandfather or you, David, with your grandfather, I, you caused me to think about what am I doing with my grandkids? And so I'm, I find myself being much more deliberate about it. Yeah. And, and, we're, and we're inviting our community. We have uh, now 10 million readers of our weekly newsletter, which is mm -hmm. pretty amazing uh, for me, at least. And to have, uh, to have our community now sharing back. So we, we wrote before, uh, back last month before, uh, Thanksgiving, asking people to share their rituals with us. And yeah. we're collecting stories from families and individuals about their rituals. And boy, it is a rich collection. Yeah. Rituals it's... play an important role in your world? Yeah, I mean, partly, you know, we do what most families do at Thanksgiving. We go around the table and talk about um, what we're grateful for and things like that. I used to be part of an extended family, sort of a chosen family with 40 uh, teenagers in Washington, D.C., and they tended to have some family issues. So we would eat together every Thursday, uh, and we would go around the table and say the high point of the week, the low point of the week, something really troubling. And it was just a, the, it was just a beautiful way to establish a friendship. Me, a middle-aged white guy, and most of them were young African-American or Latino kids, and we could really cross the boundary. Uh, and so we ate the same meal every Thursday night. We did this for several years. We did holidays together. We did vacations together. And it was the same go around the table, everybody. And then if it was a, a birthday, we would all say what we appreciated about the person. And rituals, among other things, they just mark transitions in our lives. And so it's a graduation. It's a bar mitzvah. It's a wedding. And you need a, a moment to mark that transition. And then sometimes there, there's just a lot of wisdom in them. And so if, if you lose a spouse, it's not obvious that the thing you should do for the next week is go to a party every night. <laughs> but in the, in the Jewish tradition, yep. sitting Shiva is a, it's a very wise thing because it gives the, the grieving person something to do because they've got to help organize all this stuff. Sure. It surrounds them with the whole community. And then there are certain patterns within when you're sitting Shiva, when you're sitting in somebody's living room, you, can, you don't have to necessarily talk to the person who's grieving. Maybe you just talk around them but they have the comfort of your presence. And so there's just so much smart psychology embedded in, in a lot of these rituals. My favorite line of yours, and I've, <laughs> I've told dozens of people about it, is how you grew up, which was think Yiddish, act British. Yeah. So we, we were like, my joke in the book is if you saw Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. And I come from the other kind of Jewish family. So we, we were super intellectual, but it was a warm and a loving home. We just didn't really express it. Uh, rituals have played an important role in our life. And, and you touched on the, the death rituals that each of the religions have developed to help us get through that time, to give us the, 
how to or what we do for those critical uh, first few days of dealing with loss. Uh, take it a little broader, maybe, David, about how, what's a changing role of religion culturally now? Uh, I have a group of friends. Uh, I'm the youngest of the group of friends, so we're really old. And uh, it's a wonderful group. And we get together once or twice a year. We usually go down to spring training together. Uh, and all we talk about is uh, baseball. Uh, we drink, uh, have good food, good wine. And we just really, really talk. Yeah. And the last time we were together on our Saturday night dinner of that baseball weekend, I brought up the subject of, I, I, I grew up, uh, I was raised Catholic. And uh, so I guess uh, we'd be called lapsed Catholics. Now we're, we're social Catholics. That is, we need it for the rituals and the ceremonies and the, right. and, and, and the, and the and, guilt. And the guilt, <laughs> the a la carte part of it, I guess. But I found, I expressed to this group, and we had a, a several hour conversation. It was meaningful and important to me about the role religion plays in our life. And I was shocked uh, that so many of us, there's uh, 10 of us, uh, that it was an important question we were each facing, especially as we yeah. get later in life. So long, long question. What do you th what's the changing role of religion in your life? What's the changing role of religion in our culture and our society? Yeah. Well, in our, our society, I think the withdrawal of religion has had just very negative effects. And that's partly, you know, religion uh, in theory teaches you the ideal for if you're Catholic to to be Christ-like. And that's just a, a beautiful example to be a, a man who organizes his life about uh, self-sacrificial love. All of the major religions seem to have a, a very right. consistent set of rules. Be good, be good to your yeah. neighbor. Treat other people yeah. the way you like to be treated. These are the things you just can't do. It right. sort of all comes to the same set of yeah. rules and to then, live your life by structure. Right. But then there's the congregation. So if you're in a church or a synagogue or a mosque, uh, and somebody dies, and the it, then everybody in the in the congregation knows what to do. Yes. And so it's it's not like, will I show up for my friend or am I not? It's like we all show up. That's what we do. And so I think the the fact that many people are without congregations has been a loss. Uh, and um, so I, I think a lot of the, us have tried to fill that loss. And even my little book, you know, it used to be if you were lonely, if you didn't know how to deal with your, your friend has depression, you would go to your clergy and say, how do I do this? And your clergy would offer you advice. And now there's a lot of people are not attached or not close to a member of the clergy. So they they have to find somebody to go to. And so I try to collect wise wisdom and pass it along. In my own life, I, I've had an interesting journey, which is I grew up in the Jewish home, as I said. But I went to a church school uh, in lower Manhattan, and then I went to a church camp. Mm -hmm. And so I had these two stories in my head. I had the Exodus story from the Jews and the Jesus story from the Christians rattling in my head. And that was, uh, but I didn't believe in God for the first 50 years of my life. So they were just wisdom traditions to me. Which and then, is fine, right? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's how I spent most of my life. Um, and I think they have a lot to teach. Um, and uh, now, when I became sort of middle-aged, um, I found that my, the categories in my head, which were secular categories, didn't explain the world as I experienced it. Yeah. And so if you're from New York, you know that the second ugliest spot in New York is Penn Station in, on 33rd Street. But the first ugliest spot is the subway next to Penn Station on 33rd Street and 8th Avenue in a subway car. I happen to experience this sensation that everybody around me has a soul, that there's some piece of them that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but it gives them infinite value and dignity. And then we're not equal on the level of our brain power. We're not equal on the level of our muscle power, but we're all equal on the soul. And so I had the sensation that all these people around me, their souls are either full of joy or they're longing or they're sick. And so there's some piece of them that's not material. And from that, I sensed that I came, that there must be a God. And it was a long, slow journey after that. But I, I sort of came to faith, and I will say that it's not been like my life has been utterly transformed, to be honest. Uh, there's a guy named Frederick Buechner, uh, who came to faith in middle age as well. And he said, you he writes this, you should wake up every morning and say, can I believe all that again? Can I believe that there's a God? And he says, if your answer 10 days out of 10 is yes, then you don't have the kind of faith I have. But if you can say, yes, I believe that six days out of 10, 
then you should do it with great joy and laughter. And so he he sort of gave me permission to be faithful without while having doubts. Mm. And I, I will say, I, I, the to me, the world is is transcendent. There's some transcendent forces and of love that underground the universe that I, I now sort of believe in. But and that in, involves a lot of wandering, a lot of doubt, a lot of uncertainty. But it's been, um, I think, a source of maybe even a little bit of this book because to know a person. You want to see that every person you meet is made in the image of God. And I don't care if you're Catholic or Jewish or atheist or agnostic or Muslim or Hindu, but if you treat every person you meet as a possessor of a soul, you'll end up treating them well. And if you treat every person you meet as made in the image of God, you'll approach them with that right kind of respect and reverence that they deserve. Is that a journey you went through or you're going through? Definitely still going through. I, I There was sort of a... The way I liken to it, um, this was back in 2013, so about a decade or so ago. Um, it's like I'm sitting on a train, and I'm looking around, and we're all sitting in the same places. We're drinking our coffee. We're reading the paper. And it doesn't seem very remarkable. But then you look out the window, and you realize you've traveled a long way. And my sensation was that I traveled a long way away from atheism. I was no longer an atheist. Mm -hmm. I'd crossed some boundary. And there was a lot of ground behind me, and I was a believer of some sort. Then that didn't explain what kind of believer I was going to be or what I was going to think. But it it was a very long, slow, gradual process, which I'm still very much in the middle of. And, and when you say process, David, what what kinds of things do you do? Is it people you turn to to, to discuss this with, to help? Are the people like we look to you that you look to to help you think differently, how to understand the situation better, how to think yeah. in a very uh, untraditional way about it. How, what's yeah. your process like? How do you yeah. how do you pick at that? Well, I've, I've learned that if you are in the middle of a spiritual journey, people give you books. <laughs> and so I got about 700 books given to me over the course of like <laughs> six or months or a year. And you're opening up a new bookstore, which is a good Yeah, which is good. I'm going to sell them. <laughs> and so the people I found helpful were from different traditions. Um, I became close to a guy who died a year or so ago, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi of Britain. And I, I really come to appreciate uh, his work. Abraham Joshua Heschel, Viktor Frankl from the Jewish tradition, uh, C.S. Lewis from the Christian tradition, a guy named Henry Nouwen, who's a, a great Catholic writer. Uh, I have a friend who uh, is a beautiful writer. He, he write, he's a poet at Yale named Christian Wyman. Uh, and he wrote a, an absolutely gorgeous book called My Bright Abyss, in which he talks about his own religious journey. And it it's, it was important for me to have a, someone who, frankly, is a little cerebral, because I'm a little that way, uh, but also deeply spiritual and deeply humble about um, obedience, and in Chris's case, obedience to the cross. And I just, uh, the way he experiences faith, he's, he puts it more much more beautifully than I ever could. But it's so rewarding when you find somebody who experiences faith the way you do which is everybody has their own version in my experience. But but language is the only tool we have available to us, I think it's the only tool, uh, to, to probe at these questions. It seems to me that with all that you've read on the subject and the journey you're going through, that if you keep probing at it, 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 it just, how do you, you're reprogramming your mind to think differently, to be open to other concepts. Yeah, and it's felt very useful to me to have people who could put things into words that I am feeling, but I haven't quite put into words. But then I will say, and this was, you can go back to when I was 13. David, and, that's what we look for you to do. Well, <laughs> we, I, I, I'm, my favorite phrase about being a writer is I'm a beggar who tells other beggars where he found bread. So if I find something <laughs> useful, I, I pass it along. But I will say, you know, I went to this church school in New York called Grace Church School. If people know New York, it's by the Strand Bookstore in Lower Manhattan. And it was beautiful. The architecture was beautiful. And it was gothic. And I must say, when I was 13, my grandmother took me to Chartres Cathedral in France. And I didn't believe in God for all those decades, but I still found some, there was something in Chartres Cathedral that was just otherworldly. And I found that consistently with gothic cathedrals. So that I think some for some people, music talks to them about the deepest spiritual things. For me, architecture is a very, just a very powerful to be in a place that somehow feels sacred. Yeah. Wow. So you just you just corrected me and answered my question. No, language isn't the only tool we have. 
it's music and it's architecture as well. Yeah, or art. I think there are, there are many ways to get into this. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Tell me the the impact of your friend Peter Marx losing him to uh, suicide. You you wrote about that. You've spoken about it uh, many times. And I found that your the way you talk about that to be very helpful. Uh, all of us have unfortunately know people who are suffering with uh, uh, depression, severe anxiety, different kinds of mental stress, ergo mental illness. And uh, it was comforting to read how how you've dealt with that, and and we all feel the need to respond, to try and help, and uh, share with us what lessons you learned from that. Therefore, that we should be able to uh, use as a guidepost in terms of how we deal with similar situations in each of our lives. Yeah, my friend Pete and I met when we were eleven at a summer camp, uh, and we've stayed friends for life. And he had, in many ways, a very blessed life. He had became an eye surgeon and was very successful and uh, had a, a wonderful wife and two wonderful boys. Uh, and But then at 57, he just got hit with depression. It didn't come totally out of the blue, but it really uh, more severe than anything. Um, and so I had to be a friend. Uh, and I made the mistake that I've now learned many people make, which is the first thing I did. And we, we walked through this for three years together. Um, was first to say, um, well, here's an idea for how to get out of depression. You know, you used to do these service trips in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You want to go do that. And I learned later that if you're telling a depressed person, if you're just giving them ideas how to get out of it, you're just showing you don't get it. Because it's not lack of ideas that they're missing. It's lack of energy. It's lack of a lot of other things. But it's not ideas. The second mistake I made was to say... Um, well, you know, your life is so blessed. You sh should really appreciate what you have. You did the inventory, huh? Yeah, and the great marriage, great career, great kids. And I learned that is you're just making them feel worse because you're reminding them they're not enjoying the things that they're really enjoyable. And so they begin to blame themselves. And so gradually over time, I learned there's very few things you can do with words to help somebody out of depression. But there are things you can do just to be a good friend. And the first is just to acknowledge the situation this sucks, this really sucks. And to make them, to keep asking them about their, their experience so they don't feel alone in it. Uh, and so it's just so they feel there's somebody there to accompany them. The second thing you can do is you can say, um, I want more for you. I want more for you. And those words won't have any magic effect, but they'll at least show a burst of goodwill. I want more for you. Uh, and um, so the third thing you can do is just show constant reminders, I'm still here, I'm still here. So you can send people texts, a quick call, something like no response necessary, but I'm here, I'm not going away, I'm walking here through you. And I wish I'd done more of that. And then finally, I, um, I read in Viktor Frankl's great book, Man's Search for Meaning, which was written after he was in the Nazi death camps. He said when he was in the death camps um, and somebody was contemplating suicide, he would say to them, life has not stopped expecting things of you. There are still problems in the world that life is calling on you to answer. And one of those problems is the suffering of others. You've endured this, and that gives you credibility to speak into other people's lives and understand what they're going through. And it sounds kind of harsh, like life is not expecting things of you. But it's just Victor Frankl, he knew what he was doing. And to call people and say, yes, you know, you have a lot to give the world because you're strong enough to endure this. And so those are some of the things I learned during those three years. It's an amazing journey, and uh, it's uh, you're, you're providing us with a good ch a checklist of things to run through. And it reminds me of the story you told earlier today about uh, your rabbi friend who had the woman who had the the brain uh, the brain surgery and, and would fall from time to time. And it's saying, it's just letting people know you're there for them. You don't have to have the right words, right? And the words are not going to. And in cases of depression, the words are. They're not, they're not going to solve a magic problem. And my friend Pete succumbed, as he said, to suicide. And there's nothing I think any of us could have done. I, as a friend, certainly as his wife and kids, did everything that was humanly possible. And sometimes the beast is just bigger. And so you, you have to face that harsh reality. But that doesn't mean you can't try to show up in the, as good a way as possible. Hearing about a, a, a male friend, 57 years old, all, all that seemingly having things that people would want to be happy and and not being able to be happy 
I wonder how much of it is physical too. You know, is it a brain chemistry issue? But from a social point of view, it reminds me of something I wanted to ask you, which is the changing role of men in in our culture, in our society. Uh, I wonder what you think about uh, the strides we've made as a culture in terms of giving, uh, uh, creating a, an environment where women have equal opportunity. Uh, we now have more women enrolled in college than men. We have far more women in professional schools than than men. Uh, it seems like the 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 gains of women's uh, freedoms and opportunities might have an inverse impact on men. And I wonder is that is that the case, or or is what what's happened to the to the role men have in terms of the things I learned as a kid, the things you learned as a kid, and now being told that no, that's inappropriate. It's the rules are hard to follow now for a young man. Yeah, I try to think they're not zero sum that the gains of women do not come at the cost of men and the gains of men do not have to come at the cost of women and it, it so, shouldn't the, right yeah. yeah and so there's a great book i would recommend by a guy named richard reeves called of boys and men and it's just a whole series of statistics troubling statistics on how young boys are struggling and i think a couple of things have happened one is good which is i think men are much more capable of talking about their emotions than they used to be yes. and i think a lot of dads and granddads are more emotionally open than they used to be the tough thing is that there's something about the way we've structured our school systems that make it just a lot harder for boys. Uh, the sitting still for long periods of time, uh, doing well on these uh, exams, uh, there's just something that they're not thriving. And one of the pr problems I found in my own kids' education was that they would go through elementary school and there were no male teachers. And so there yes. were no, no male role models. How do I be? And so that that was that just makes it harder. And so a lot of young men are just falling further and further behind. And we have to find ways to diversify the way we educate people so that it's just possible. And one of the things Richard Reeves talks about is that guys' brains mature on average, mature later than women's brains. And so he suggests- Several years we, later, right? Yeah, I think two to th three or four on average. Again, every yeah. individual is different. And so his suggestion is he what he calls red shirt the boys. So girls, how old the guys should go into school at age and first grade at age seven instead of age six. And so they'll have a little more time for their brains to mature and they'll be they'll enter college, say, at 20 instead of 19. And that that's a very practical thing that I think is worth trying because uh, we can't be on the current trajectory. David, I wonder what you would think about a year of service. I couldn't be more enthusiastic about that. Um, you know, it's just, I had a, worked with a guy for the PBS News Hour named Mark Shields for many years. Sure. And he said the first time he really met a black guy, he was showering with him in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Uh, and so that was military service, but we should have national service. And in part because um, it's super important that people from Berkeley, California, sometime do a year of service with somebody from Birmingham, Alabama. Yes. Uh, they're just to know people from different parts of the country across all the many differences we now have and all the diversity of the country, uh, and then do something for the common good, give a sense of patriotism, I'm serving my country. Uh, and then, frankly, another benefit would be them and uh, people entering college a year later, because I've been teaching pretty much my whole life college students, and often they're not quite young enough to receive what they should be receiving in college. They just haven't had enough life experiences. And so another life year of life experiences, I think, would help them with their education. Uh, and the especially important thing, and a friend of mine named Mark Friedman emphasizes this, is intergenerational service. And so Mark tries to take funds that go to AmeriCorps, which is for young people, yeah. and funds that go to Senior Corps, which is for senior citizens, and to merge the funds and merge the two groups of people. And so they serve together. You get a 65-year-old and an 18-year-old serving together. And I have found that kind of relationship, like we were talking about grandparents before, just tremendously powerful relationships between across the generation. Well, that, that's a great idea. And it, we, we, we think about that. And look, we, we go, can all read the demographics. And you talk about the fact that we have uh, so many more people over 60 than we have under, uh, under 20. Uh, and that's just going to get, uh, it's, in, it's already baked how it's going to become uh, more and more uh, the case. And we just had this conversation over dinner a night or two ago about 
I think the most underutilized force in our country is uh, uh, seniors. Yeah. And uh, conversations, uh, when some people, though I think the whole concept of retirement is going to be rethought, has to be. And uh, look, I'm a, I'm a broken down old guy, but I love the idea that I'm still working and involved because I find it exciting and stimulating. And I love being around young people, but I think your idea or your friend's idea of uh, I, maybe a year of service at 65. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm, you know, my wife and I are going to my alma mater uh, this spring to teach a course, but this time we're not teaching for college students. We're teaching for people between the ages of 40 and 70 or so. Uh -huh. And it's what to do with the last 30 of your life. And so how to transition from the career phase where you're accumulating, you're acquiring to the service phase of your life. And mm -hmm. so it involves a real mental transition uh, from, you know, capitalist to servant. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of retired people who are on the cusp of retiring uh, and they're terrified because then maybe they're working in a company and they think one CEO said to me, you know, I think I had 200 friends in this company, but after I retired, I realized I only had five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, a lot of people, their identity is in their work. And so what happens when that goes away? And I've been interviewing people who are in other university programs who have gone through this transition. And one of the things I've learned, and it's humbling for me, is I ask, how much do you know when you're in a program and you've all just retired? How much do you know about your career, the careers you all just left? And the answer generally is, we never talk about it. Uh, so may occasionally, we get a person say, I used to be a senior partner at some fancy law firm. Um, right. But we're not defined by what we did. We're defined by what we want to do now. And so it's very humbling to me that people really do uh, leave it all behind. And I ran into a woman named Ann Keller, and she had been a prosecutor in her career. She goes off and she goes to Stanford and takes one of these courses and how to think about the last 30 of your life. And she decides, I'm going to do the things that I know nothing about. And so she recently wrote a play about Anne Boleyn, one of Henry VIII's wives. Uh, and she, when I interviewed her, she was getting it uh, read by a new San Francisco theater company. And wow. she was having the time of her life. And she said, I can fail big. Who, can, who gives a crap? I'm 65. <laughs> and so, and that's a great attitude. I met uh, recently uh, Deepak Chopra. Yeah. And he talks about in his culture that they live their life in 25-year increments. Yeah. And he's just about to enter the fourth phase of his life, which is all about service and giving back. Yeah, I, I did. One of the best things I ever did with my column was I asked my readers over 70 to submit what they we call life reports. Go back over your life and grade your life on how you did career, how you did with your family, how you did with your friends. You give yourself grades. And I found that the people who were happiest had divided their lives into like three to five year chunks uh -huh. and think, what am I going to do with this chunk? Uh, and the other thing that I learned was the obvious, which was nobody regretted a risk that hmm. no matter where, whether a business paid off or didn't, they, they were glad they did it. And so that's an obvious one. The other thing was that people on average gave themselves an A minus for their career and a B minus for, for their, their relationships. Yeah. They thought should, they should have done better. So many lessons in your book, uh, David, the way I've read it is I, I picked it up and digested it in chunks and gone back to it. I, I suspect I'll continue to do that for some time. How's the book doing? Uh, you know, you I see that you write in four year cycles. You get yes. something you chew on for four years and bump it comes out of book. You've done that six times now. How's the book itself doing? It's doing actually great. Um, it's selling way more than my previous books at the current stage of the cycle. And it, I think what's helped and uh, this was a surprise to me was it came out on October 24th. And of course, a few weeks before October 7th, all the stuff yes. in the Middle East happened. I thought that might bury the book, but life has become so brutal. Yes. And a lot of the conversation so fraught that there's been extra de desire for somebody who can explain how do we remain human with each other in brutalizing times. Well, you've certainly given us a lot of uh, ways to think about uh, remaining human, being human, uh, getting better at being human. And so your book is a, a treat. I'm so glad I, 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 I got it. I've read it. And we'll read it many more times. And uh, it's such a treat to spend time with you today, David. Uh, I've been a fan for a long time. Uh, Lisa, who I mentioned is my producer, uh, mentioned to me uh, just earlier today that your columns 
that uh, that I distribute to my different networks of uh, my different text groups that I try and maintain relationships with are the ones we share the most. Oh, well, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a uh, it's it's really an honor and a treat, and I thank you uh, for your time today and for writing this book because I think you give us tools to help ourselves and so many others around us. Oh well, thank you. I'm so I'm honored by all the nice words and and especially for the invitation to come have a chat with you. Mm -hmm.